So it's a good opportunity to stay with them. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Timothy. I think I'll start reading in chapter 3 before we get into chapter 2. 2 Timothy in chapter 3. Perhaps it would be best to realize we finished our theme of studying the book of Exodus. And before I actually introduce uh, the new study that we're going to do, uh, I'm not going to take a book immediately, uh, but I want to say some things and study some things that come out of 2 Timothy 2.15. Uh, but just before I read that, I think perhaps a, a good introduction would be for us to stop and consider what the Apostle Paul is saying in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and realize that when we read this, that we're reading this from a man uh, who is on death row. And uh, these are the last things the Apostle Paul ever wrote. And you know that you're not going to wait and mix words when you're about to die, realizing you have set some things up and got some things going uh, in this world that God wanted accomplished and started in this world. And uh, these are what I would call powerful statements from a man on death row. He says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he starts in verse 12, and it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, uh, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead in his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, the instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and that and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto failures. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we, may we take heed the warning that the Apostle Paul gives us in this passage of Scripture, and, and open our eyes to see what the Scriptures would have to say as it gives us truth and uh, gives us information that's going to help us, whether it be doctrine or reproof or correction or instruction in righteousness. And Father, as we study this, may our eyes be opened on how we can properly understand the word of truth and be a, uh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. In the Savior's name we ask this. Amen. Yeah, when I read the book of 2 Timothy, I can't help but to see that, you know, if I'm going to look for powerful words from a man on death row, uh, and I should probably say a man of the gospel uh, who is on death row. He's not on death row because he's a murderer. He's not on death row because he's done something against the government or any man. He's on death row because he spoke the truth of Christ, and he filled up the afflictions of the gospel that are in Christ. He brought more of a revelation of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, and they didn't like Jesus Christ when he walked the earth, and they don't like the message of the cross of Christ after he left. And as a result of that, the Apostle Paul is in prison, and the governments of this world don't understand all those things, and they are going to follow the influence of the ungodly people of this world, and the Apostle Paul is going to be executed at the hands of Rome. Uh, as, as thought to be, he'll probably lose his head uh, as a result of his... One that God, by prophetical utterance, told the Apostle Paul to lay his hands on him and appoint him to be an apostle with Paul in the ministry to the Gentile churches. And, to, and Paul gives Timothy some instructions in here. And when I go through the book of 2 Timothy, all these words are powerful words from a man of, uh, preaching, a uh, man who preached the gospel who is now on death row. Uh, I, I, I just keep, I keep seeing it powerful everywhere I read. But there is no doubt that when he starts telling Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 12 that all those that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, that's not only true of where Paul's at, but it's true of anyone who will live godly in Christ Jesus. And that living godly is having God's life living in you. And this world doesn't like that. And all those will suffer persecution. One of the things I've understood uh, probably in the last couple of years that really helped me, and, and it happened, I think, by teaching the Dearborn class, is that I began to realize how important it is for me to take young babes in Christ and warn them that they're going to suffer if they live for the Lord. 
Uh, Paul did that with the Thessalonians, spent very little time with them, and began to prepare them immediately for a time of suffering. So take note of that in verse 12, and realize where Paul is writing this, a dungeon in Rome. And he warns us again in verse 13, that evil men, shall, shall, uh, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Nothing worse than having a man teaching you who has deceived himself. That those things are going to get worse and worse, and he warns us of those things. So in order to combat that, he tells Timothy, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And you know, if Timothy was Paul's disciple in the faith, you know what, what Paul means by that. Timothy, continue in the things that you have learned, so continue in that truth that's been given to you, but don't forget who gave them to you. There's, an, there's a reference here to the Apostle Paul who taught Timothy some things. And then also some things that Timothy learned from a child, which he calls the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament that was pre-written before Paul's day and before the Apostles' day, that the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. But as Paul is writing this to Timothy, not only is there that Old Testament, the Holy Scriptures, but there is the New Scriptures that are being written, the, the rest of the, what we call the New Testament. The, the words of Christ, as it's called by the book of Hebrews. And so Paul says in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So that's a reminder of the things that Timothy has heard and who he learned them. And realize that when Paul wrote, Timothy, or Peter tells us that when Paul wrote some things in his epistles, Timothy, Peter calls them scripture. And so what Paul talks here and says all scripture, it's not just that Old Testament that Timothy grew up on, it's those new things that are being written as, as men are, God, are moved by God and inspired of God to write. And those things that they wrote, those things that are written down on paper in black and white, are came out of the mouth of God. They're God-breathed. And they are profitable. They are profitable for doctrine. And you better have that because there's going to be ungodly men, there's going to be seducers, and deceivers and, and people who are going to teach even being deceived themselves evil men and seducers so what you need is all scripture given by inspiration of god because it's profitable for doctrine for reproof doctrine is teaching for reproof is is getting things uh, uh corrected in your life when you do something bad the children do something bad you reprove them and there's some things in your life that are out of line and the scriptures will reprove that for correction sometimes you've got some bad thinking you're thinking wrong, and the Bible will correct the way you think. It will give you correction. For instruction in righteousness, how are you supposed to live? The scriptures will be able to instruct you in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. When you see all scripture and man being perfect unto all good works, you begin to realize the value and the authority of scripture. That the Bible itself is what, what all of us need to have our teaching come out of that Bible, all of our reproof come out of that Bible, all of our correction come out of that Bible, all the instruction come out of that Bible. It does not open up and say there's another authority on this earth that's found in the cardinal of bishops or, or in the community of faith. It doesn't say you need anything outside of the scriptures. Amen. The scriptures is able to make you perfect and thoroughly work in you and furnish you unto all good works. Based on that, notice what he says to Timothy. Now here's this dying man realizing that the time is coming, he's going off the scene, and evil men and seducers are going to get worse. The solution is, the Bible is all of God. The Bible is the authority. Amen. Therefore, he says to Timothy, I charge thee, therefore, based on what we just read, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead and is appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, the instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Timothy, your job is now to preach the word. You know, the Bible has come to a point when you come to 2 Timothy, we're over there in our studies on, on Wednesday studying 1 Corinthians, and we're realizing that God is still speaking through prophets in 1 Corinthians. <coughs> now we can all have it for ourselves. And God's not going to pick, reach down and speak through certain individuals, whether they be, call themselves an apostle or prophet. God's going to speak to all of us through his written word. That was his intent, to get this in writing. And when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And what a cry difference here is when you come to Timothy, Paul instructs Timothy not to stand up and prophesy in the church. 
He says, Timothy, based on the fact there's going to be seducers and evil men, and it's going to wax worse and worse, but Scripture is, is what God has given and is profitable for all men and to make men thoroughly furnished, that he charges him before God and the Lord Jesus Christ that he preach the word. Timothy's going to now be a preacher of what is written, the word of God. And then by the authority of that word, begin to, to be able to reprove and rebuke and exhort with long suffering and doctrine. Be patient and just keep on teaching. And the reason you've got to be patient and keep on teaching, it says in verse 3 of chapter 4, for the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And let me tell you, friends, we live in such a day as this. There no longer are people content to come and study God's Word and sit under teaching of God's Word and endure that anymore. No, after their own lusts, that is, their own desires, finding people that are going to say things that they want to hear. And so they have heaped to themselves in our days preachers who will come up and promise them wealth and promise them health and promise them perfect peace in the days. People who do not promise that if you live with Christ, godly in Christ Jesus, you'll suffer persecution. They don't want to hear such things. They don't want to hear about long suffering and God helping us through the times of long suffering. And, and they don't want to hear those things and people have heaped for themselves and all you got to do is turn on the religious program and look at how many people that are heaped into a building listening to a man say exactly what they want him to say Amen. and care nothing about the true teaching of what God has to say today in the age of grace so Paul has warned Timothy there's been a time that they just won't endure that you need to be aware of the fact that you will have within your own lusts and desires I'm a little tired of hearing this stuff over and over and over again I want something more lively. Let's have a praise and worship celebration worship uh, every Sunday. Let, let's just reduce the preaching down to 20 minutes and, and uh, let's have a little bit more praise and worship of God. It makes me feel good. And that's what's going on all over the place. And Paul is warning that such a thing will come. And that the answer to it all is in the scriptures. And as Paul is facing death, he charges Timothy soundly, does he not? Well, with that, I want to take you back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I want you to show you and, and, and tell you what we're going to study because we're going to study something that this church is known for. If you've come here at all for any length of time, you know that what we teach is God's Word rightly divided. Amen. And now I'm going to teach a series that, uh, based on 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. There was a man that attended our service who no longer attends this service. But when he came in, he says, you know, you guys use uh, rightly dividing the word of truth as, uh, as uh, other people use praise and worship. He, he says, you, you got this catchphrase, rightly dividing, everything's rightly dividing the word of truth. And he began to realize that was an emphasis in this ministry, one that I'm not ashamed of. Amen. Uh, one that, that now I'm going to preach a series on. And, and yet I would say that most of the people sitting here have been here for some time and have heard these things over and over again. And yet, yet I know to do that. I know to preach it over again. And the reason I know that, if you look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul said, well, let me start in verse 7. It says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Amen. Now, when Paul said that to Timothy, he knew Timothy already knew that. <laughs> That's why he said, remember it. And you can't remember something you had to learn first, right? But after you learn it first, then you've got to put it back in your memory. And you've got to remember, yeah, that, that is significant. That, that Paul talked about Jesus Christ who was of the seed of David and how he was raised from the dead, but he was raised from the dead not according to what Peter and them said, but he was raised from the dead according to what good news Paul delivered to us. So Paul tells Timothy to remember it. He says down in verse 14, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to, uh, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So Timothy, in his instruction, he's to put people in mind of these things. Not only is he to remember, he's supposed to say it over and over again. 
and then he's to study to show himself approved. And the reason he's supposed to do that is in verse 16, he's to shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Study the scriptures, because people are just going to start babbling things, and it's going to bring about ungodliness among God's people. Only the truth is going to produce in you godliness. And so Paul tells Timothy to put the people in remembrance of these things and don't stop studying. And in that studying, don't stop rightly dividing the word of truth. So you and I are going to go back over these things. And if you have saw my pattern of teaching, but generally what I do is I'll teach uh, through a book. When I'm done through a book, uh, I, I begin to realize as I'm going through a book that there is some basic truths, some things that, that we stand for here that we need to go back over. And the reason we do that is there's always people coming in. And so it's time to go back and to refresh ourselves about the things we stand for. And, uh, and so generally I'll teach a series, a topic. Uh, you might recall that the, when we finished the book of Exodus, that I went and taught a series about Elijah and Paul so that I would have an opportunity to refresh us about the difference between prophecy and mystery. And uh, when I finished that, I, I kind of blended what happened is I started out teaching the difference between Paul and Moses, but I was enjoying the book of Exodus so much and it turned out to be a study of the book of Exodus. So we have been studying the book of Exodus for some time now. And now it's time again for us to go back and to talk about the things that we believe here at Grace Bible Church, what makes this ministry different than other places. Paul in his dying breath, in his dying writing, writes to Timothy and tells Timothy in verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we come to realize, and I hope you have, that this Bible is the authority, and it's what we need today, not only does Timothy need to preach it, but before he preaches it, he better study it. And if you're going to allow it to be your authority, and make sure that people only rebuke and admonish you based on the authority of the scriptures, you better study it yourself as well. And so the, the instruction here to study, to show thyself approved unto God, Timothy now is not going to have to get prophetical utterance and just walk in and God is going to automatically speak through him. Timothy, if he's going to have a ministry among the saints now, in the mature age of grace when that which is perfect is come, Timothy's going to have to spend time in study. And so Paul instructs him to study, to show himself approved unto God. You know, studying is something that, that is a responsibility for all mature believers. It's a responsibility for every believer. And you know, realizing study, it's one thing I challenge people all the time to read your Bible through. Uh, I, I think it's important for us to get a grip of if all scripture is profitable, we better get all scripture, at least have some references in our mind that God's Holy Spirit within us can start using that scripture to guide us and instruct us in the areas of righteousness. Uh, and so it's important to read it. But you know, reading it isn't the same as studying it, is it? I mean, you can't study it until you've read it. So not only do you, are you going to be told by the Bible to read the scriptures, but you're told here to study the Bible. To spend time and, and study is something that, that uh, people who go to school will realize that it's going to be required if they're going to get any kind of decent grade. You can't just go and listen to a teacher and think you're going to pass the class. You're going to have to go home and read the material they've assigned, and you're probably going to have to underline some parts, and you're probably going to have to put notes down on a page, and you have to spend some time actually working to understand some things. Amen. And so he says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Gee, that tells me that not everybody is going to be approved by God. That's right. Not every believer does God look down and approve of their ministry, their habits, uh, their, the things that they teach. He tells Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. There's going to be a time in which we're all going to give an account of our lives to God and the things that we've done in this world. And is it a result of us studying his scriptures and having his scriptures truly work in us and furnish us unto all good works? Or do we get motivated to do certain things in our life because we thought God wanted us to do it? Without ever going to the scriptures and find out what God wanted us to do. Do we let God's word live and direct our life and become the means by which we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life? Or do we just flippantly decide what we're going to do or how we're going to do it? And if so, your ministry will not be approved before God someday. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. Ooh, that goes with the word study, doesn't it? I mean, I, I think of a workman when I'm walking down the street and I see them back here lately, construction workers. 
Now, in fact, I brought one in our assembly, the same guys who built the addition back here at another church that put in an elevator shaft and they came across a septic tank and the whole, the whole, the whole elevator shaft was filled with sewage. And for days they pumped it out, got it all cleaned up, and walked away and filled back up again. <laughs> Uh, you know what those guys were doing? They were working. <laughs> so that's the kind of that's labor that I wouldn't want to get into. I'm glad that's not what God asked me to get into. <laughs> but when I think of uh, working, I think of guys who are busy. Busy, working, putting effort, labor into the things that they're doing. And Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman. Don't ever forget, though, when you talk about workmen, that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That is, the workmanship, the, the work that you're to do, God is creating that in you. You're his workmanship. And as you study to show yourself approved, you are, you are a workman that needeth not to be ashamed <coughs> if you rightly divide the word of truth. You know, that approval there, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That means some people cannot, not only will they, not, some people not be approved, but some people can be workmen who are someday going to be ashamed of all the work that they've done. That's the warning that the Apostle Paul gives in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when he says, As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and let another man take heed how he builds thereon. <laughs> that warning is very strong because there is a there is a plan that was given by God to the Apostle Paul, and because of that wisdom given to him, he was the wise master builder, and he warned people to be careful how they build on Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to the twelve apostles' gospel. But he was also raised from the dead according to Paul's gospel. And what God is doing today is he's building the body of Christ. He's not building the kingdom. And some men are studying the Bible, and they are workmen, but they're trying to build the kingdom and offer that to God. And someday when their works are going to be tried, they're going to stand before God and they're going to be ashamed that everything that they were doing is going to be burned up and had no value because it wasn't what God was doing today. Amen. Biblical, yes. but the wrong dispensational message. Amen. So our goal is to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, be workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. Why? Because we know exactly what God is doing through our studies. We know exactly what God is accomplishing through our studies. And we're going to participate in what God is doing. And as a result of that, you won't need to be ashamed someday. In fact, the Bible talks about receiving rewards. Amen. And so you won't need to be ashamed because it says here, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, that's the whole key. The key of a dying man for us to know how it is that someday at the judgment seat of Christ we won't be ashamed. He says it right there. We have not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, that rightly dividing means to, to cut it straight. It's almost like a surgical thing. We, we take something, we dissect it, we cut it, we divide it right where it belongs to be divided. Exactly in the right place. Man. Some things on this side, some things on that side. It's making distinctions and differences that ought to be made because there are differences and distinctions in this Bible. And the Word of God is going to be the means by which you'll be able to cut and make the divisions. God made some divisions. And you need to know what those divisions are. And when you study the Bible, you can know what those divisions are. And when you go into a workman, you won't be working in the wrong field, doing the wrong thing that, that God isn't accomplishing, but you'll be doing exactly what God is doing and trying to accomplish in this world and accomplishing that we're trying accomplishing in this world and you can be a part of that and therefore you won't need to be ashamed and all of that comes through rightly dividing the word of truth now you know what it is that you got to study i've heard people use this there, there, all kinds of things come out of this verse some people talk about study and they say this is not just the bible this is also the lexicons and the greek language and all these other things and you know i, I do believe that in study those things are helpful but I don't think that's at all what Paul's telling Timothy to do. Not at all. Uh, I don't mind someone in their workmanship being so so profound in the Bible that they study that Bible and, and dissect it and get every word out of it and even run for other teachers for help because that's what those books are. Those are teachers. You're here getting taught from a teacher. That's no difference if you grab a book. But the truth, the word of truth, is the Scriptures. Amen. And therefore, when Paul said to Timothy, study, he wasn't saying everything there is. He was saying, study the word of truth. That's why he told him to preach the word. 
That's why he talks about all scriptures given by inspiration of God. There's no doubt here when Paul told Timothy to study, it's study the Bible. Not study what the Bible, not what other people said about the Bible, and, and a lot of people spend their life doing that. In fact, that is probably the reason why so much, so many people are stuck in traditional teaching, and even their teachers, they have been seduced, and they're passing on the seduction. Amen. Because in their teaching, they forgot to learn the Word of God, and they, they learn from another person, and from books, and from Dr. So-and-so, and now when they get up and teach, they really are teaching what Dr. So-and-so said. And as a result of that, their work, they're, they're going to be ashamed someday at the judgment seat of Christ. Because if they would have spent the time in Scripture and rightly divided the Scripture, they might not have repeated what Dr. So-and-so said. Amen. And, and so they'll, they'll be ashamed for such things. So it's the Scripture. When he says study, there's no doubt about it. It's the Scripture. It's the Bible. That Bible is your authority. You better be careful about those who change the Bible. You see, there's another group of people who take this verse, and when it says rightly dividing the word truth, if you have another Bible, it probably says rightly handling the word truth. Handle it correctly. Rightly divide and handle it correctly. That's got a little different meaning to it. Now, in fact, it doesn't even imply correctly handling may, might mean, uh, you know, to, to reverence it, uh, to, to believe it, but it doesn't mean to divide it. And the reason those other ones say correctly handle is they are a translation from a different Greek text than the King James comes from, and it doesn't say the same Greek word that comes to rightly divide. It's a whole different Greek word. They have a different Bible. You know why they got a different Bible? It's because back in the 1800s when, the, when, 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 when there was an apostasy in the church, some leaders of their apostasy, scholarly men, decided they could correct the Bible. They didn't believe all scripture was given by inspiration of God in their day. They didn't believe they had scripture inspired by God. They believed it was their job to help God out a little bit and put some scripture together and, uh, and correct it. And as a result of that, they didn't understand anything about right division and not being ashamed before God. And they, they just they changed the Greek word because they thought that it should be a different Greek word. And they changed it. So nowadays people have Bibles that said rightly handled. When the Bible says rightly divided. Amen. And that's what we're going to study. What does it mean to rightly divide? <coughs> well, you know, as we said, it means to cut straight or make clear cuts, and make clear cut divisions in the Bible. Uh, but what I want you to think about as we just approach the subject today, uh, I want you to think about this, is that when you, when you make divisions, <coughs> what you're going to do is you're going to make a distinction of things that are different, right? So you're going to look for things that, that differ and make a clear distinction of those differences. Clearly separate them. Not take them and kind of put them all together, but find those differences and separate them in their proper categories. Now, if it's the word of truth, this will be true, right? And this will be true, right? But at least it won't be a mixture of truth. It will be divided truth. Truth that belongs, in one case, to the nation of Israel. Truth that belongs to the body of Christ today. Amen. You're, you're going to make clear cut differences and put them in their proper place. And it doesn't mean one's not true. They're both true. They're both of God. But then when you make those clear differences, you need to then determine which part is God doing today. Because what you want to do above all things is not only be saved, but do the will of God. And, and what God's will is, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, is it's God's will for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants people to know what he's doing today. And so the way to do that is to rightly divide the word of truth. So we're going to do that. But as you think about rightly dividing the word of truth, before we start doing it with the scriptures, I want you to think, just in your own study of the Bible, how much God divides time on. I mean, if I would ask you to think, you don't have to repeat it now, but think in your mind, in the Bible, different verses that have to do with time. You might think of the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Gee, there's a division, isn't there? There was an eternity past, and then there was a beginning of time. That, that's different, isn't it? That's a clear distinction. And as, as you think about those differences, uh, they, they happen all the time. For instance, I, I think what it says in Peter, when he talks about the flood of Noah, he says the world that then uh, the, the world that then was and the world that now is. He talks about the world that then was was overflowed with, with a flood, and the world that now is is reserved under the fire of judgment. Boy, did Peter ever divide, huh? He made a clear distinction. And boy, if you ever want to think about a clear distinction, spend some time someday studying what life on this earth was like before the flood. 
and realized that Buddha was 969 years. The world that then was was vastly different than the world we're living in today. That was destroyed. Maurice was doing that this week. If he came to church, and we were talking on, on Monday at the a senior study, and Maurice was there, and, and I told him to think about the Garden of Eden and what it must have been like before it was corrupted by man and before God threw man out. And Maurice spent a couple days doing that. He come here and said, man, it must have been beautiful. Well, don't forget that Garden of Eden was still here until the flood. It wasn't gone. And, th and there was still some of that beauty of the original creation was here until the flood. And when the flood came, it destroyed everything. And we live in a world that's vastly different with mountains and oceans. Those things weren't here before that. Things are different. But, you know, that, that's what Peter tells us. The world that then was and, and what is now. Well, what a difference that is. And as you think about those differences, you get you realize in your Bible you have, even as it sits, there's what's called an Old Testament and a New Testament. Now, whether that's a proper terminology as it sits in our Bible is one thing, but you realize there is such a difference. Uh, because God said to the nation of Israel, he gave them the law, and then in the book of Jeremiah, he says, a new covenant I'm going to give you. So there's new and old. You read the book of Hebrews about the old fading away and the new coming in. <laughs> That's a difference, isn't there? There are distinctions that you're to clearly define in your Bible. And Paul says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. He did that because there is a distinction between the gospel that was preached before him and the gospel that the Apostle Paul preached. Amen. And he said, don't ever forget that. He said, Timothy, put people in charge. Remember these things. And so we'll spend the time doing that. In fact, you ready to hear Timothy? Come back to, uh, well, look at this, chapter uh, 6. 2 Timothy, chapter 6. Now, what's 1 Timothy, chapter 6? We're going to chapter 6 and 7. What a time flies. Second Timothy, uh, First Timothy, chapter six, and, and Paul says some things here, and he says in verse, uh, well, verse fourteen, he says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show unto uh, show uh, who is the uh, the blessed and only potentate, King of Kings and Lord of Lords who only have immortality, dwelling in the light that no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, you need to realize that Paul wrote this at a time that he was first in prison, released, and he's hurrying back to go back to prison because he's going to be executed when he gets back. He's on some kind of a release in here, and, and he's already going through some trial at Rome. And uh, those trials haven't gone so well for him. And when he talks about that, he says, when he talks about the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, notice he said in verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate King of kings and Lord of lords. You know why Paul's saying that? He just got done answering to the Caesar. And he didn't get a fair trial at the Caesar. And you know what? He's not going to get a fair trial in this life at all. And he's saying in God's times, not this time, but in other times, in future times, God is going to show this world who's the only potentate king, kings, and Lord of Lords. Amen. Now you can read in 2 Timothy chapter 4 how Paul said in his first trial, no one stood with him, but the Lord was with him. Can you imagine how lonely it was to stand there and be incriminated and lied against? And, and have the judge side against you in that court of law. And Paul facing that realized, he said, well, in his times. It's certainly not this time, but in his times. And you know when God is going to show who the only potentate, king of kings, and lord of lords of this earth is? Times, it's plural, isn't it? There's a time coming after the age of grace in which we're living in today, in which God is going to show from heaven who's lord of this earth. Amen. And boy, you read that book of Revelation, and you watch the people run and hide in the rocks and hide from the wrath of the Lamb and judging them, and you begin to realize God is showing this world something they never realized, that Jesus Christ is the only right to king of this earth. But you know, when he comes back in the second coming, there's another period of time that's going to follow that. It's a, called the millennium. It's a thousand years where Jesus Christ is going to rule over this earth, and he's going to rule the Gentiles, the Bible says, with a rod of iron. You know what they're going to know? They're going to know who the only potentate, king of kings, and lord of lords is. But you know what this world does not know today? Who it is. 
They don't know who's the rightful king of this earth. And Paul knew that in his time while he's sitting there. And you know what? It helped him to know why it is that he's being unjustly condemned and getting away with it. The evil people are winning and getting away with it. And seducers are going to get worse and worse. And why they're going to get away with it. He knows why. This is not the time that God wants to demonstrate who that his son is the only king of kings, Lord of lords. And if you come back during the week, you'll find out what God is demonstrating today as he's long suffering. His patience, his willingness, that his willingness that all, that all men come to repentance. That God today wants people to be saved, not judged and condemned. And he wants to show the riches of his kindness and his grace toward us. Just come over since you're there, First Timothy chapter 2. And let me use this for my closing verses. Second Timothy chapter 2. Paul says in verse 1, I exhort therefore the first... Oh, I said second, didn't I? The first ten of the I don't hear as many pages. Did I say it right? Surprise yep. oh. <laughs> <laughs> First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, I exhort therefore, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that you may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There's a verse about time, right? Mm -hmm. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and why not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Paul says the truth about Jesus Christ dying and becoming a ransom for all because God wants all men to be saved is a truth that God never testified until he raised up the Apostle Paul and sent him out to testify it. And until that time, God wasn't preaching that message. And God wasn't telling people that Jesus Christ died for everybody. And that wasn't the message that was going out. But you know something in that passage is that when he converted Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul the Apostle, it was for that reason to let people know that they could be saved. Now we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth. What we're doing, what we're talking about, and why we're going to talk about it, is so that you will know not only to rightly divide the word of truth, but how to rightly divide it, and why you're to rightly divide it. And if I could illustrate it this way in close. If you could put yourself back to be a teenager, you could probably put your back at yourself back into some confusing times in your life. <coughs> because you know, as a teenager, you really don't quite know who you are. Because you used to be a little child who looked to mommy and daddy for everything. And all of a sudden, you're beginning to realize, I'm an adult, and I've got some responsibilities and decisions to make. And I don't even know if I agree with mom and dad anymore. And you know, those become real confusing times. Because as you go through those times, you begin to question who you are and where you fit in. And what, is, what are you supposed to be doing? I got my son now who's gone through the school system. Now he's ready to go into the adult world. And the question is, what are you doing with your life? That's a scary, that's a scary place to be. I remember when I finished high school, I went to Macomb College. I didn't know what classes to sign up for. And the counselor says, okay, what do you want to become? <laughs> what a scary thing. And a teenager, teenage life is a very scary thing. You know, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you realize that you might get saved and you're living like in those confusing times of your life because what the dying words of, of the gospel and the messenger of grace would have you to know is what you need to know. You need to know how to be saved today, first of all. And if his gospel is different than a previous gospel, there's a difference. You need to know how to be saved. After you're saved, you need to find out who in the world you are. Who are you? And Paul will talk about what your identification is today. You need to know where you fit in in the programs of God. God was doing this. God's doing something else. What is he doing? Where do I fit in? Only right division is going to tell you where you fit in. Then you, what, what, what should I do? You're going to get your instructions in the age of grace from Paul's epistles. And then, and then as you mature and understand that, you begin to see the questions of when did it start? And where is it going to end? And you begin to understand the blessed hope, what you're looking forward to, what God has planned for you in the future. You begin to understand the very purpose of God for your existence. And then with all of that understanding, you begin to understand something that's so important in life that every child begins to ask it, why? Why am I here? Why do I have to do that? 
Why? Why does Paul go through some suffering? Why is Caesar winning? Why is God revealing himself today? You begin to understand the wisdom of God in the revelation of the mystery when you rightly divide the Bible. So that when you live through life, you don't live through life ignorant, that you have understanding. That's the importance of right division. In the weeks to come, as we break this down and learn how to rightly divide, and then start looking at those divisions that you ought to know and why you ought to know them, you'll be established in the faith and become a grounded believer. Let's pray. Now God and the Father, we do pray that the series of studies that we're about to go into will not only find its importance in our life, but will find a practical living in our life. And that, Father, it will come to a point that we'll realize that we are in